Hey, Tom Sharpling here, the host of The Best Show. And if you've never heard of The Best Show before, everything you need to know is right there in the title. Each week we put on the best live podcast you're ever going to hear, featuring live callers, celebrity guests, music, plenty of surprises. Who knows what's going to happen? Last month alone we were joined by Conan O'Brien, Patricia Arquette, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, Nathan Fielder, Sunan Archives, John Oliver. The list goes on and on. So what are you waiting for? Join us live every Tuesday night on Twitch at 6 p.m. Pacific time and find us the next day on the Forever Dog Podcast Network and wherever you find podcasts. Warning, this podcast contains explicit language. Hi, I'm Stoya. I write and I used to make video porn. And I'm Rich Joswiak. I'm a writer who frequently focuses on sex and significant others. Welcome to the How To Do It podcast, where we try to help you with all of your sex and relationship issues. You can ask us anything about sex or your bodies or dating etiquette or whatever. We're here to help. Jessica, you were saying earlier that you're (laughs) weird about (laughs) dirty talk. Yeah, first of all, I take issue with the fact that our phrase with which we describe sexual discussion in the heat of the moment is to call it dirty. Yeah, that's so telling. Yeah. It's so American. I'm I'm already like, this is like really shamey and that is an anti-Dijiac for me. Right. Like it has a dampening effect. It's so aversive to me. Ugh. And I, I've been ranting at length for the better part of a decade about how the language with which we describe sex, right? We have uh, clitoris, vulva, labia, vagina, and then like pussy, coochie, snorcher, fanny, like all these things that like really evade the subject. Yeah. And I don't feel good about evading the subject. Other people find it weird when I'm like, I'd really love to feel your penis inside me. And they're like, do you have to phrase it that way? And I'm like, I do. Because I can only say cock so many times in a row. And so it's like cock, penis, cock, penis, cock, cock, penis, cock, penis. There's also dick. Are you totally averse to dick? The way it comes out is so direct dick. Yeah. Like, I'm like, yeah, you're di- like, I'm, I'm <laughs> sneering at it. It's, I become like a dominatrix <laughs> in that moment. Right. So it's like, really, like, it's a lot. And I've gotten better at like controlling my face as I move through the world. But sex is such a vulnerable thing that like, I can't control my face and my tone in the bedroom and still enjoy myself. So to call it dirty talk is like weirdly intellectual leaning towards medical. Mm -hmm. How's yours? Uh, Mostly non-existent, I would say. I like sex as a refuge from the verbal realm in which I spend so much time. That's kind of what I find appealing about it, that it's communication on a nonverbal level. I, I can work stuff in. I can't really, in general, perform if I'm pressured. So if somebody tells me to speak, to talk dirty to them, that's probably going to end up being a flop. I have a very limited kind of vocabulary. I do like to check in and be like, do you like this? Do you not like this? But I tend to keep the discussion at a minimum, let my body talk. But I would say I'm generally kind of unoffendable. You could pretty much say whatever you want as long as I'm finding you hot and you're really selling it. Except what I don't like is when I've been called somebody else's name, which is like on the obviously very clean side of dirty talk, but it's just the worst. It's just like, like really couldn't even be bothered at the very least hide the fantasy that you've got going on that has nothing to do with me. Like, come on, that's just rude, you know? I've called people by the wrong name before. (laughs) Well... Don't do it with me. (laughs) (laughs) In a faraway land where I grow a glorious penis. (laughs) The, The talking, I like rehearse lines in my head because some people 
require it to mm. feel like comfortable about the consent. They right. need verbal reinforcement. So like, for instance, don't stop. Really not a good thing to say in the middle of sex because the person hears don't or stop or they're being trained to ignore don't and stop mm. and the brain's pattern recognition, I really believe, slows down on that point when they're hearing don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. And then maybe 10 minutes later, you're like, don't. <laughs> Right. It's also such a superfluous thing to say unless they have, in fact, stopped. Yeah. You know, if you want them to keep going and they're going, then you can assume that they're not going to stop. It's a minefield because it's some of the most intimate expression and the speed of thought and discourse around sexuality that can happen because of the way that it's suppressed by ourselves and by various systems and like social media outlets, it's just slower. Yeah. Well, with that out of the way, <laughs> let's hear our first question. Dear How to Do It, I'm a woman in a new relationship and it's going well. He's ridiculously hot, funny, a feminist, all the good things. The sex is also fun and getting even better. I have more experience with kink and sex generally than he does, but he had a lot of unexplored desires and a lot of eagerness, so we're having fun trying some things. One problem that's coming up, however, is the balance between dirty talk and romantic talk. My partner is not particularly verbally demonstrative and has a reputation even among his friends of being a bit inscrutable. With me, he's warm, physically affectionate, and respectful but he is not good at compliments or verbal affection. If we're going out somewhere fancy and I spend an age making sure I look like an absolute smoke show, he won't even think to tell me I look good. In previous relationships, I preferred a lot of verbal affection, but I'm also trying to not overlook the other ways he shows his feelings. The problem now is that he has very recently become very interested in dirty talk that has me in a sub role and enjoys him, I, both of us, referring to me as his slut, his whore, etc. I'm into this. It's fun and hot. He got into this dirty talk very quickly and easily. Yet, despite repeated requests, he hasn't put any effort to work on compliments or verbal affection at all. He's now called me a slut about a hundred times more than he's told me I'm pretty. And that's making everything feel a bit unbalanced in terms of the sexual and romantic. And also feels like he can make the effort to become comfortable with new things, but only when it benefits him and involves calling me a whore. I'm getting a bit uneasy, but I don't know how fair it is to conflate these two things. Any advice? Signed, just tell me I'm pretty. I would say I completely understand the rationale this is a very logical concern. I think we're somewhat outside of the realm of logic when we're entering the sexual and romantic spaces. And I think one could very conceivably find himself interested in domination and the language that comes with it. While when it comes to love and one's you know, quote, love language, maybe verbal isn't on the list. If this guy weren't affectionate and all of the other things that she says he is, I'd be more worried. But as it is, I don't know that it's that much of a contradiction in terms, even though it looks like it on paper. Just this detail of not being told she's pretty. It strikes me as obvious that that kind of positive feedback is something that she needs to feel valued. Yes. Now, let me, at the ripe age of 35, tell you pretty does begin to fade. Um, yes. But not <laughs> and, for you. I'm not agreeing with you about you. I'm just agreeing with the concept. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Was not fishing. But it's not something that you want to base your identity around. So be cautious with that, right? Be aware that this is a thing within yourself that you need to keep an eye on and make sure that you're building the things that will still be appealing about you and of value about you when you're 65. 
and you've aged out of the demographic that's like hot. Yes. There there were air quotes. I don't know if they were audible. I mean, isn't he with his sexual interest essentially telling her that she's hot without saying those words, you know? I I don't know. I feel like I can tell somebody thinks I'm hot and they don't need to say it, you know, because of what they're doing with my dick. So to me, it's like, if you need to hear that, then ask, get dressed up and say, how do I look? Yeah. Do the fishing. It sounds like she has pointed this out to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's not learning. And so it, it is worth being so utterly direct that there is no room for interpretation even going so far as to say you've called me a whore a hundred times you have never told me i'm pretty i need to be told i'm pretty let's figure this out maybe it's while we're having sex and he's telling her that she is his pretty slut yeah Maybe it gets incorporated that way, saying, I get dressed as a show for you. So as a feminist, he may be doing something that, like, I've told people to do countless times, which is compliment people on something they've put work into or, like, earned somehow or created for themselves. But I'm just now realizing that for some people, pretty is actually something that they have achieved. Yeah. I think that's a great point. I know Jane Fonda's agent, and I once met her at a premiere. And, you know, I was like, oh, hi. And I was like, you look amazing. And I have never experienced such a chilling shutout by anybody. I mean, just literally turned her head and I didn't exist to her anymore. And I was like, I I mean, you are a movie star. I kind of thought that was part of the point. Sorry. I I was able to win her back after the movie a little bit. You know, we talked about the movie and she handles a chicken in it. And I asked her about bonding with the chicken and that worked better. But to your point about feminism, it it could be fair to assume that maybe he's had experiences before that have turned him off from calling women pretty, from complimenting their appearance in that way. And that calling someone a slut, a whore in bed exists in a completely different realm of communication than that. Yes, and so you may need to negotiate. I like having the word pretty applied to me. Let's dig in and figure out why I'm not currently getting this word that is important to me. And I think it's worth it for the writer to really consider if it's possible to be happy without that. Totally. And if... If that's not the case, like, communicate what the stakes are. Exactly. And and if it's a matter of, like, look, for whatever reason it's tripping me up, if you're going to call me a slut and whore, which we both enjoy, you're going to have to, just for my sake of making sense of this relationship, call me pretty sometimes. I don't know if, like, being so transactional is always the way to go, but it actually seems like it's come down to that. So see what he thinks. He seems like a reasonable person or capable of it. And also like aftercare is a thing and perhaps Mm. in the moment, right? We've talked before about transitions, you know, like moving between one kind of moment and another and you don't just like stop on a dime Aftercare can be very useful and healthy for a relationship and making that a space where you hear the positive affirming words that you want. For sure. So I I think the biggest takeaway from this one is have another one of these conversations. and, And like Stoya said, name the stakes. Tell him exactly what's up. Even if it sounds silly to say it, this is clearly something that's bothering you. If he is a conscientious partner, he will at least try to work this in and to give you what you need. Honestly, it's not asking that much. So ask away. No, it's like a very understandable thing to ask for. Yeah. Hey, Tom Sharpling here, the host of The Best Show. And if you've never heard of The Best Show before, everything you need to know is right there in the title. Each week we put on the best live podcast you're ever going to hear. Featuring live callers, celebrity guests, music, plenty of surprises. Who knows what's going to happen? Last month alone, we were joined by Conan O'Brien, 
Patricia Arquette, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, Nathan Fielder, Sunan Archives, John Oliver. The list goes on and on. So what are you waiting for? Join us live every Tuesday night on Twitch at 6 p.m. Pacific time and find us the next day on the Forever Dog Podcast Network and wherever you find podcasts. All right, let's hear our next question. Dear How to Do It, I'm a 25-year-old woman with an extremely high sex drive and a generally excellent sex life. But there's one hang-up that I've had for my entire life that I just can't seem to figure out. I hate touching myself, and especially penetrating myself. Whenever I stick one of my fingers in my vagina, I start feeling nauseated by the first knuckle and have to stop. It isn't physical pain, more like revulsion or anxiety. I have marginally more success touching myself without penetration, but even then, feeling my clitoris get hard can leave me feeling too repulsed to continue. Even typing that gave me shudders. And the thing is, I do masturbate all the time, but only by humping a pillow or a piece of furniture. Nothing that involves me touching my own vag directly. How the hell do I get over this? Is this something I need to talk to a therapist about? Like I said, I'm generally quite satisfied with my sex life, but I'd like to figure out how to make myself come with my hands without feeling like I'm about to throw up. Signed, can't put a finger on it. Okay, well, this is a question about principle mostly because it seems like our letter writer has figured out a practical solution for this revulsion. You know, excellent sex, masturbates all the time, doesn't seem to actually even need this thing that she is so repulsed by, but I understand it's become a hang-up. What do you think about that? Do you think it's worth pushing forward, pushing through on principle? I mean, she wants to. Yeah. And I don't feel concerned about her causing herself harm. She seems to err Mm -hmm. on the side of, like caution yeah so my stance is like 100 percent push may the wind be at your back get in there and see what's going on it might be worth talking with a sex positive therapist about this even if they don't have answers they can be a guide and a way of like having things from last month reflected back at you and helping you recognize that there's a theme This is something I did a little bit of Googling about, and it does seem like there are more people who feel this way, you know, have sex, masturbate, don't touch themselves. And I don't know if there's like a name for this particular condition. I mean, there's obviously people who don't masturbate and people who don't have sex and all this stuff. But it's a very sort of specific relationship with touching oneself here that I'm not sure a fine enough point has been put on to say this is this condition. That said, this is a thing that people report and, you know, it could come down to a lot of things. According to this, uh, I found like someone's Medium page, starkraving.medium.com did a piece on it and they postulated that it could be a matter of trauma which is not confirmed or denied in the letter. But also society talks a lot about the vagina and, you know, it's bad, it's gross, it's loose, it smells bad, all of this stuff. You know, you get bombarded by messages. You shouldn't put things in there. You shouldn't put things in there. It's like a pretty dominant one. Yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense that someone might be very sensitive to this messaging and may have absorbed it and now is dealing with workarounds. And that's a big one to overcome. But I don't know that you get anywhere without actually locating exactly what the issue is. And it doesn't seem like our letter writer has done that yet. So I would say set aside time, feel around at different levels of arousal. If you can get the first knuckle of a finger in there, sit there for a while and see what comes up emotionally mentally like if there are like images floating across your brain or you're like feeling sensation in a certain part of your body like pay attention to that if you feel up to it maybe kind of press that finger around in different directions and see if it's like oh when I press towards the front wall then I want to see what 
a gynecologist has to say about what's going on after an exam. Yeah. The only other potential issue I could kind of discern or hypothesize is maybe some kind of gender dysphoria. I mean, I I, I don't know. It's just, it's so wide open. There's something in general different about having things inside of us, Mm -hmm. like being a receptive sexual partner, having an exam done, but there's also something, at least for me, and I think there's several other people who feel this way, there's like a like category of this should not be inside me, or there should be nothing inside this part. And so like when I get the pap smear and they go up in the cervix and like rub around with the sample swab, I hate that so much. And so gender dysphoria could be it. It also could be something else about the relationship to the body where our writer is just more sensitive to stuff inside of her and putting a part of herself inside of her is the thing that is one step too far. Feeling your own insides. Now that I'm thinking about it, like it actually seems very weird how often I feel my insides. Um, (laughs) Not to make you self-conscious or anything. (laughs) Yeah. No, but I'm like, hi. Yeah, you know, like I use the menstrual cup and then I sometimes I got to like go up in there and get it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just like in a public bathroom sticking my entire hand in my vulva. No big deal. And I'm like, that's a weird thing. Yeah, yeah. But I I think no matter what, it's just important to get to the bottom of it. I I don't think that any progress is made before she does that. So yeah, I would talk about this with somebody, preferably somebody who specializes in sex, like a sex therapist. Yeah, and if, if you're like listening, and you're googling gender dysphoria, and you're going like, oh, that maybe sounds like me, while you're looking for a therapist or waiting for the therapist, Kate Bornstein's My Gender Workbook is a good way to get a trip through the existing kind of thought around gender that might be worth investigating to see if you recognize yourself there. All right. I feel like we need some, like, sad funeral music. (laughs) Right. Yeah, that's all for now. This is actually our last podcast. Yes, for now. I mean, who knows what the future holds, but that's it for How to Do It as we know it in podcast form. Our column from which this was spun off will continue. You know, I feel bummed out, but I also feel like so happy with what we've done and just the opportunity to get to do this is such a privilege that like that's the gift you know that's the amazing thing of course it'd be wonderful to keep doing it but the fact that we did it is just amazing to me i love this this is a great experience a plus yeah i definitely understood when we were offered the ability to do a season that this was a trial run Mm mm-hmm You know, I got the memo halfway through that our numbers weren't quite where they needed to be. And so I wasn't surprised. And the framework for me this whole time has been like, we get to do a season of a podcast. Exactly. And that was, in fact, what happened. We have done a whole season of a podcast. It's been so much fun. I think it's been good for the column. Yeah, no, I agree. I love having your voice in my ear in real time to hash this stuff out. It keeps me from making any rash decisions and from kind of like defaulting to the hardness that I sometimes, uh, you know, like I, I, I'm hard on myself. I'm often hard on other people, etc. But I feel like your presence makes me more sensitive and that's only a good thing. So... Uh, and you know, not to mention your expertise and intellect and everything else that I appreciate from talking to you, but yes, it's really been a wonderful, enriching experience for me. I'm so glad we got to do it. I'm very proud 
And I mean, I it's just like, you know, tick another one off the dream come true list. You know, it's just awesome. This is great. You've challenged me to think better and do better research. And I don't know if you know this, I read every advice column of yours that I see. Yeah, same. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's important to do so. And I don't know, for me, the podcast has been so wonderful, but it's always been kind of supplemental to the groundwork that we've laid, that we continue to lay with the column, which is not going anywhere, at least, you know, not in the immediate future. And that's really exciting to me. It's something that like, I really put my whole heart into. So uh, to me, this is gravy. And the actual column is is the meal that keeps feeding us. And I love that. You know, I love it so much. I'm so glad to have you as a partner, really. It's wonderful. It's such a pleasure. And so, you know, with that said, we're still doing the how to do it column on slate.com. So you can continue to follow all of our sex advice there. You go to slate.com slash how to do it to check it out. You can also write to us there and let us know if you need any sex advice. And if you sign up for Slate Plus, you'll get member exclusive columns every week, as well as a bunch of other exclusive advice columns. So head over to slate.com slash how to do it. Our show is produced by Chow Tu. How to Do It's editor is Jeffrey Bloomer. Our letter readers are Shasha Leonard and Benjamin Frisch. And thanks again for listening. Thanks so much. This was great fun. Hey, Tom Sharpling here, the host of The Best Show. And if you've never heard of The Best Show before, everything you need to know is right there in the title. Each week we put on the best live podcast you're ever going to hear, featuring live callers, celebrity guests, music, plenty of surprises. Who knows what's going to happen? Last month alone we were joined by Conan O'Brien, Patricia Arquette, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, Nathan Fielder, Sunan Archives, John Oliver. The list goes on and on. So what are you waiting for? Join us live every Tuesday night on Twitch at 6 p.m. Pacific time and find us the next day on the Forever Dog Podcast Network and wherever you find podcasts.